Welcome to our hybrid event on Assignment China, an oral history of American journalists in the People's Republic with Mike Chinoy. It is such a treat to have such accomplished journalists in the room, Mike, John Pomfret, and Mary Kay Magistad. We cannot wait to hear all of your stories. This event is in partnership with our Asia Society Center on U.S.-China Relations, which is run by our colleagues out of our New York headquarters, and we appreciate the chance to collaborate with them. A warm welcome to our board and advisory council, everyone here in the room in San Francisco, and our audience watching virtually from online. I'm Margaret Conley, the executive director of the Northern California Center. We have an hour and 15 minutes for this program. We'll finish at 6.45 p.m. After that, we're going to have a book signing right outside with our guest speaker. For today's format, I will very shortly introduce our event partner colleague, Mary Kay Magistad, in the front row here. She's going to introduce our guest speaker and moderator, Mike and John. Mike will give a slide presentation, and then John's going to join the stage and lead a moderated discussion with audience Q&A, too, and we do want to hear from you. When the time comes for Q&A, please raise your hand if you have a question. If John calls on you, wait for a microphone to be brought to you so our virtual audience can hear you. Please introduce yourself, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. This event is on the record. We are recording, and the video is going to be posted on our YouTube channel. A few words now about Mary Kay Magistad. Mary Kay is the Deputy Director of the Center on U.S.-China Relations. She is an award-winning journalist who lived and reported in East Asia for more than two decades. She's been to every single province in China. She reported for NPR, PRI's BBC's The World, The Washington Post, and more. She has two critically acclaimed podcasts that you should check out on China's New Silk Road and Whose Century Is It? And because she just has not enough to do. She taught international reporting and audio journalism at UC Berkeley. Please join me in welcoming my friend and colleague, Mary Kay Majestad. Well, thanks for the kind introduction, Margaret. And we at the Center on US-China Relations are really pleased to be co-sponsoring this with, with your center. Um, I was asked recently, at another event um, by someone who I think was a little skeptical about journalism. What kind of people become journalists anyway? <laughs> and I said, I, I'm sure I gave an answer he wasn't expecting. I said, well, people who are generally open-minded, curious, generally, genuinely interested in what other people think, especially people who think differently from them and are different from them. And then I thought for a moment, I thought, you know, that's actually what an international correspondent does. And that's what an international correspondent has to do. And I would say, especially when covering China, you need that curiosity. You need that feeling of empathy and respect when you're approaching your work there. And it's so much, you can go so much deeper when you speak the language and know the history and know the culture. And both of our speakers today do all that and more. I have deep respect for both of them. I've learned from their reporting. And it's my honor to um, be able to introduce them. Um, we're here, of course, to celebrate the publication of Mike Chinoy's new book, uh, Assignment China, An Oral History of American Journalists in the People's Republic. Um, the book distills insights and anecdotes from more than 100 videotaped interviews with American journalists who reported in China from Mao to now. These interviews are featured in the 12 documentary films that Mike has done on the subject as a non-resident fellow at the University of South Southern California's U.S.-China Institute. You can find the films on their website, and they're well worth watching. They provide a fascinating history of how American journalists' access, experience, and understanding of China changed over the years and how that affected what they passed on and reported to their American audiences. All told, Assignment China has been a 15-year project for Mike, though he did also manage during those years to write books on, Iri on an Irish human rights lawyer, Kevin Boyle, and on the North Korean nuclear crisis of the early aughts, and a best-selling Kindle e-book also on North Korea, The Lost POW. Mike is, of course, a former China correspondent. He opened CNN's bureau in China in 1987, I believe. Um, he covered the Tiananmen protests and wrote the book China Live about those years. Among the awards he has won for his reporting have been an Emmy, a Peabody, and two DuPonts. John Pomfret, 
covered the Tiananmen protests too for the Washington Post, or sorry, for the Associated Press, and was kicked out of China soon after. Um, we met covering the withdrawal of Vietnamese troops from Cambodia just a few weeks after that. Um, but I had already noticed and appreciated John's reporting, then for the Associated Press and later for the Washington Post. It took some doing for the Post to get John back into China, but it did in the late 90s. Um, John has also done conflict reporting in several countries, including Bosnia, Rwanda, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Congo. His reporting there in the Congo made him a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, one of his many honors. John, like Mike, has written several books. Two of them tell the recent story of China in engaging and personal ways. Chinese Lessons, Five Classmates and the Story of the New China, Trace the lives of five of his Chinese classmates from when he was at Nanjing University in 1980, one of the first American students to be studying in China um, after Mao. Um, back, so he traced the, their lives back in time from the moment uh, up until the time when they arrived at Nanjing and then forward a couple of decades to see how a changing China had changed their lives. John's other China book, The Beautiful Country in the Middle Kingdom, America and China, 1776 to the Present, tells the story not just of how the two, of how the two governments got along, but also of the many ways in which Chinese and American people interacted and affected each other's lives and trajectories over the course of a couple of centuries. That book won the Council on Foreign Relations Arthur Ross Book Award. John and Mike will be in conversation with each other later after Mike first shares with you more about his Assignment China book and project. Mike, over to you. Thanks very much, Mary Kay. It's, it's, it's great to be here. I didn't realize that you and John had met in Cambodia because you and I met in Cambodia also, but two or three years later. You met in Saigon, or we met in Phnom Penh. Okay. Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's great to be here, uh, and what I thought I would do today is share a little bit about uh, Assignment China and some of the issues that it raises uh, before we open for conversation and discussion. Um, so I want to begin uh, going back to 1973 when I made my first trip to China, uh, just a year after uh, the Nixon visit. Uh, I went with a group of American students, and one of the places we were taken to was the Wusan People's Commune outside Shenyang. And it was there that I met a model Maoist peasant who was presented to us named Yu Kexin. And we had lunch with him and his family in his modest home. It was a very memorable occasion. In fact, I always felt it was the highlight of the visit. 20 years later, as CNN's Beijing bureau chief, I decided it would be interesting to retrace that 1973 trip and see how China had changed in the intervening years. I managed to track Yu Kuxin down, and I found that he was now running a tractor factory. He'd moved into a new apartment. He had a television set. He was clearly a beneficiary of Deng Xiaoping's market-oriented reforms. But as soon as the local officials who were escorting uh, me around had stepped aside, uh, you confessed that almost everything that I had seen during my trip in 1973 had been an illusion. He told me that, in fact, conditions on the commune then were terrible, that even the food I had so enjoyed had been trucked in by local officials from the city the day before just to impress the foreigners. To me, this episode underscores a central theme in any discussion about the history and experience of foreign correspondence in China. And that is the challenge of finding the truth in a vast, complicated country with a long history of distrust of outsiders and a secretive and authoritarian political system. Oh, what happened here? There we go. This, by the way, is Joe Kahn, who in the 1990s was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal and then for the New York Times, and is today the executive editor of the Times and one of the more than 100 people whose interviews make up the heart of Assignment China. The stakes couldn't be higher because over the decades, reporters for the American media, like Evan Osnos of The New Yorker, seen here, have played a critical role, profoundly influencing US views of the country, as well as the policies of successive American governments. 
Moreover, because of the reach of news organizations like the New York Times or Washington Post, CNN and the other television networks and the wire services, their coverage has also shaped perceptions of China around the world. For many consumers of news, however, the way the information they read in newspapers, magazines, on, or online, or listen to on the radio, or watch on television actually gets there remains something of a mystery. Few people understand what goes into the reporting, writing, and transmitting of news. This, by the way, is John Pomfret interviewing student leaders in Tiananmen Square in 1989. Yet, as any journalist will agree, this process decisively shapes virtually any news report. And with China now emerging as a global superpower and its relations with the US more strained than at any time in the last 50 years, here, by the way, is a throwback to an earlier, more friendly era. That's John Shayan of CBS News with Deng Xiaoping. And behind them is uh, 60 Minutes correspondent Mike Wallace. And that photo was taken in 1986. But especially today, understanding the people who have covered China for the American media and how they have done so is a crucial step in helping everyone understand the news they are watching or reading. Providing that understanding is the central goal of Assignment China. The story of the journalist in Assignment China begins with the triumph of Mao Zedong's revolution in 1949, at which point virtually all American and other uh, Western journalists were forced to leave the country. Indeed, when Mao proclaimed the establishment of the People's Republic in Tiananmen Square on October 1st, 1949, not a single American correspondent was there to cover the event. For most of the decades that followed, um, American and other Western reporters had little choice but to cover China from outside the mainland, most notably from the then British colony of Hong Kong. The China watchers, as they became known, relied primarily on official Chinese media, which they monitored religiously for clues. Bernard Kalb, who sadly passed away recently, was based in Hong Kong for the New York Times and CBS News in the 50s and 60s. About China, we got bits and pieces. We read everything we could. We put the mosaic of pieces together and try to extract some narrative about what was happening in China. But this was bits and pieces journalism. It was a very frustrating beat, especially when China was convulsed by upheavals like Chairman Mao's cultural revolution of the mid-late 1960s, which American correspondents couldn't see for themselves. Indeed, it was not until Richard Nixon's visit to China in 1972 that the door began to open. At that time, China had been cut off for so long that many journalists, even such network heavyweights as Dan Rather of CBS, felt that it was like going into outer space. It was a little bit the feeling we're leaving Earth and going deep into the cosmos of some distant planet. In the wake of the Nixon trip, China did become slightly more open to Americans, and U.S. news organizations slowly began to get greater access. Here's Ted Koppel of ABC News with cameraman John Lauer in 1973. But it wasn't until the U.S. and China established formal diplomatic relations in 1979 that American news bureaus were finally allowed to open, and American news organizations were finally allowed to open bureaus in Beijing. The interest in China was enormous. When Deng Xiaoping, who had by then established himself as the country's senior leader, visited the United States, the images of him wearing a cowboy hat at a rodeo in Texas cemented the idea of Deng as the cuddly communist and China, and of China as an attractive strategic and economic partner for the United States. The economic reforms that Deng initiated heightened this perception, which was fueled by the cascade of stories that newly arrived American journalists did about the changes underway. Jim Laurie opened the ABC News Bureau. With the programming on ABC and NBC and CBS uh, in 1979, that is very much reflected. China opening up. Every little uh, innovation that occurred in the late 70s that were part of the reform program that Deng was outlining were seized upon. The first private restaurant, the first private car, the first of this, the first. It was all a series of firsts. But journalists discovered that living in Beijing was no picnic. They were followed by security agents and found it difficult to have unsupervised contact with ordinary Chinese. 
Melinda Liu, a Chinese American who opened the Newsweek Bureau, would often dress like a local to avoid the scrutiny of security personnel and mingle with ordinary citizens. But the encounters that reporters had with Chinese that they met were often fraught. fraught. Fox Butterfield of the New York Times met a woman who spoke candidly about sexual values in China. After his article, which did not name or identify her, was published, the government found out who she was and imprisoned her. Richard Bernstein of Time Magazine did a story about a prison journal he got hold of written by a jailed dissident. Bernstein was questioned by police, and the dissident's sentence was increased from three years to 11 years. Still, by the mid-1980s, as reflected in these creations by a new generation of avant-garde artists, there was a significant relaxation of Communist Party control over China's political and intellectual life. Arguably, it was the most liberal period in the history of the People's Republic, including the country's first nude art exhibition, as reformers sought to push the country towards a more vibrant and tolerant system. China's growing openness to the world was reflected in a historic interview that Deng Xiaoping did with CBS News correspondent Mike Wallace in 1986. It was the first time a Chinese leader had sat down with a Western TV journalist. The reforming trends, however, alarmed Communist Party hardliners who made repeated attempts to roll them back, periodically launching campaigns against so-called bourgeois liberalization. Dorinda Elliott, who arrived in 1986 for Newsweek, tried to interview a farmer in the countryside about one such campaign. And her experience, I think, gives a very good sense of the challenges that journalists faced then. Journalists, this was firstly no easy thing. You had to go through the foreign affairs office of the you know, province, and then it got down to the town level, whatever. By the time I got to the village, I probably had 20 you know, Chinese you know, officials, Communist Party officials following me. And I remember going into this farmer's house and I'm trying to have a conversation with this farmer in Chinese. But in the meantime, you know, like 15 or 20 government officials come into this tiny little house with me and the entire village is basically looking through the window. <laughs> The farmer, the family of farmers are totally terrified, have no idea what's going on. So I turn to this woman and I say, so tell me, you know, what, what do you think about the bourgeois liberalization campaign and, and, you know, what's going on? And she says, she looks absolutely terrified, doesn't know what to say. And she says, well, the reason that we're supposed to support bourgeois liberalization is because, and you could see the officials saying, no, 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 you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to be opposing bourgeois liberalization. And, you know, I felt like, oh my God, what have I done to this poor farmer? With the huge pro-democracy protests in Tiananmen Square and elsewhere, 1989 became a watershed moment in the history of media coverage of China. It was due to an accident of history, the visit by Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, which the Chinese authorities wanted to be widely covered. As a result, CNN and other broadcasters were given permission to bring in satellite dishes and other transmission equipment. Then the students literally stole the stage on which the Sino-Soviet summit was supposed to take place. The live broadcasts, and today when it's possible to transmit live from almost anywhere via an iPhone, it's easy to lose sight of just how unprecedented such coverage was, captured attention around the world and presented a picture of China utterly different from the narrative the Chinese Communist Party had long sought to impose on foreign journalists. But on the night of June 3rd and 4th, the army was ordered to crush the protests. The following day, from the balcony of the Beijing Hotel, Jonathan Scher, a cameraman for CNN, and Jeff Widener, a photographer for the AP, captured a moment that has become one of the iconic images of our time. Oh my God, zoomed in on it and started videotaping it. And they were trying to scare him off by shooting over his head. Well, shooting over his head was basically at, at where our position was. It was the fifth floor, the fourth floor, whatever balcony we were on, but the bullets were so close you could hear them whizzing by. And at that point, we just locked the camera down. It was just too dangerous. There were bullets ricocheting around. So I'm just like waiting for them to get shot and holding the focus on them, waiting and waiting, and it's too far away, and I just, this is too far away, it's too far away. 
And I look back at the bed and I had that lens doubler, which would make my 400 and 800. And I had to think, do, do I gamble? Do I go back to the bed? Maybe I lose the shot or do I just shoot this wider? So I took a chance and I ran to the bed, got it, put it on the camera, open the aperture up all the way. One, two, three shots. The images of the man in front of the tank became a symbol of the crackdown which shocked the world and the coverage from Tiananmen Square produced a sea change in American perceptions of China. As the 1990s arrived, the US press corps remained focused on the bitter legacy of 1989 and the repression that still enveloped Beijing. In such a climate, with so much of the story focused on human rights issues, many reporters did not initially appreciate the moves by Deng Xiaoping, which started in 1992 with his famous Southern Tour, to revive his program of economic reform. But the attention of American journalists swiftly shifted to chronicling the dramatic economic, social, and even political changes triggered by the boom. The new atmosphere also led to a significant improvement in conditions for foreign journalists. It became much easier to travel. Officials were much more accessible. Instead of chasing them away, they often asked American correspondents for advice on how to attract foreign investment. By the late 90s, the China beat was entering what Keith Richburg of the Washington Post described as a golden era. Going on in China right now, Beijing was kind of really exploding as uh, it went from being this kind of uh, difficult place for correspondents to live to being actually kind of fun. It was an exhilarating period. China's economy was turning into the manufacturing hub of the world, and American journalists were able to dig into Chinese society in ways that had previously been difficult, trying to make sense of the paradoxes of a society where a dissident would be jailed, jailed one day, and next day you'd be covering the opening of the world's largest airport, or another Chinese entrepreneur who'd become a millionaire. 2008 was the climax of this period when Beijing would host the Summer Olympics. In the run-up to the games, the government lifted many long-standing restrictions on, on the movements and activities of foreign correspondents. But in the wake of the games, however, China's domestic political climate and its external behavior began to change. The financial crisis of 2008 and 2009 that rocked the West convinced China's leaders that the U.S. was a declining power, and the time was right for China to show a more assertive face to the rest of the world, and that included its treatment of the foreign media. For reporters, covering China became an increasingly tense game of cat and mouse with the authorities. Here's one of many examples. The actor Christian Bale, the star of Batman and other movies, was in China to promote a new film, and he wanted to meet the blind dissident lawyer Chen Guangcheng. Bale was accompanied by CNN correspondent Stan Grant and a camera crew. But outside Chen's village, just a few hours drive from Beijing, they were set upon by local security personnel. Why can I not go visit this man? man? Hollywood actor Christian Bale is used to action. But this is no movie set. We've been stopped. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Plain clothes, Chinese security, who would not identify themselves, determined to stop him and our crew contacting a detained human rights activist. No, no, watch, watch it, Christian. Watch it. We're trying to get out of here. Once again, we've been stopped. We've been stopped right here. And as you can see, they're, they're pushing Christian here. We're just trying to lead peacefully. We're trying to lead peacefully. Government anger at the U.S. press intensified in 2012 when Michael Forsyth and his colleagues at Bloomberg News produced an expose showing that relatives of then Vice President Xi Jinping <clears throat> had made millions of dollars in a host of businesses. At the same time, the New York Times' David Barboza used publicly available documents to uncover how relatives of Premier Wen Jiabao controlled numerous companies and had made millions of dollars. Every time we requested a company, we found 10 more. So if you can imagine this big chart is you have like even with Ping An, behind Ping An are 30 companies and then behind those, it ends up any company you look at is like 100 companies. I continued to map out a strategy of how to do it without setting off alarm bells, without letting people know, thinking about who was gonna be translating, what I could show people and also to go around to lawyers, accountants, bankers, and test some of the theories without giving them what I was doing because that was too sensitive. 
The stories broke new ground as examples of a new kind of investigative journalism for covering a rapidly changing China. The correspondents took advantage of China's evolution towards a more internationally engaged market-style economy to unravel complex and often hidden business dealings reaching to the highest levels of the People's Republic. Retaliation from Beijing was swift. Michael Forsyth received death threats and had to leave the country. The websites of both Bloomberg News and the New York Times were blocked in China, and their reporters had trouble getting visas. By the middle of the decade, Xi Jinping's aggressive campaign to consolidate power made conditions for journalists even more difficult, with intensified harassment, threats, and further delays in approving visas. Xi Jinping's rise and the abrupt policy shifts he implemented, including rolling back key elements of the reform program that had underpinned China's economic miracle and making himself emperor for life, came as a surprise, even a shock. Most reporters didn't see it coming. There were even suggestions when Xi first became top leader that he was going to be a reformer. Well, that turned out to be wrong. Yet in fairness, it's worth pointing out a couple of things. One is that Xi's moves, especially the ending of term limits, came as a shock to most Chinese as well. Indeed, in Assignment China, Jane Perlez of the New York Times, when I spoke with her, told me about calling a Chinese uh, contact, an academic who was largely sympathetic to many of the policies that she had implemented when she announced that he was abolishing term limits and asking him for contact, um, and when she reached him, he said, I can't talk about it, Jane. I can't talk about it. I'm just too shocked. And I think this underscores a broader, crucially important point. High-level Chinese politics have always been opaque, secretive, difficult to figure out. But under Xi Jinping, they become even more so. Indeed, there's a kind of an irony that even though China, in some respects, is more open and accessible now than during the Mao years, Xi Jinping and other leaders travel, hold meetings, they address organizations like the World Economic Forum in Davos, and so on. Our knowledge of the inner workings at the pinnacle of power is arguably less than during Mao's time. And American and other foreign journalists are not alone in struggling trying to penetrate this wall of secrecy. Nonetheless, uh, in the recent years, American journalists have persisted in doing what they could, and surprisingly, they were able to do quite a lot. This included exposing the massive campaign of repression targeting the Uyghur Muslim population in the western province of Xinjiang. It was this kind of coverage that helped make Chinese policy in Xinjiang into a major international issue. But conditions for reporters continued to deteriorate. In 2019, the Foreign Correspondents Club of China released its annual report in which 82% of the correspondents surveyed said they'd experienced harassment, interference, or violence while reporting, and 70% said they had interviews canceled due to the actions of the Chinese authorities. Access shrank even further during the early days of COVID, when nearly 20 journalists for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal were expelled. Those kicked out included Chow Dung of the Wall Street Journal and Chris Buckley of the New York Times, both of whom had uh, gone to Wuhan very early on and stayed throughout the lockdown there doing uh, important reporting, um, even under very, very difficult conditions. Beijing justified the expulsions as a response to a decision by the Trump administration to cap the number of staff at four state-run Chinese media outlets in the United States. But the move decimated the U.S. press corps in China. With just a handful of reporters there now, that has meant largely having to cover China from outside of the country, a kind of modern-day version of the art of China watching that emerged in Hong Kong in the 1950s has become increasingly important. But today, there are new tools and resources beyond just trying to decipher the state-run media. These include the Chinese internet, which despite censorship can still provide critical insights. One recent example of this is this New York Times piece. Uh, Times reporters collected the obituaries that were published publicly on the websites of official websites of the Chinese Academy of Engineering and the Chinese Academy of Sciences and discovered that there were while there were usually three or four obituaries every month, once the Chinese government abandoned its zero COVID policy last December, the number of obituaries shot up dramatically. 
It was terrific reporting, and it provided powerful evidence that the government's official death toll did not reflect a much grimmer reality. Indeed, there are today a host of publications exclusively devoted to following the Chinese internet and the Chinese media more broadly. These include, among others, What's on Weibo, which is run by a Dutch China specialist, which charts what appears on the Chinese version of Twitter. There's Cynicism, run by American China expert Bill Bishop, which offers summaries, analysis, and links to major Chinese media stories. And the, Chinese media pro the China Media Project, which does something similar. Also increasingly important have been satellite images, commercially available satellite imagery, which was crucial in uncovering the detention camps in Xinjiang. More recently, reporters used satellite images to document unusually high activity at crematoriums around China. You see all the cars in the parking lot in the image on the right from late December of last year and compare it to the empty, nearly empty parking lot in early December. This is another example of journalists circumventing official secrecy to confirm the rising death toll as the Chinese authorities abandon their zero COVID policy. In addition, there's even use of AI, such as this newsletter produced by two China watchers in Hong Kong called Five Things on China's Leaders' Minds, which uses software that can analyze web content for any keyword, sector, or individual to determine how often certain material appears. It's a way of showing what issues are preoccupying China's leaders and what they want officials in the system to think. Moreover, China's growing international involvement is also providing opportunities for reporters. One recent example was this long Wall Street Journal piece about problems in many high-profile Chinese construction projects that are part of China's highly publicized Belt and Road Initiative. The reporters talked to people in Peru, Uganda, Angola, and elsewhere. Interestingly, though, although they requested comment from the Chinese uh, embassies, companies, and the central government, no one was willing to speak to them. And this cuts to one major issue that has long affected American and other foreign news coverage of China, and that's the continued unwillingness of Chinese authorities to engage in meaningful ways with reporters. As you can see from this example, and there are countless of others, correspondents try hard to get the Chinese perspective, but their requests for interviews or access are routinely rebuffed. The upshot is that the story is unlikely to contain as extensive or nuanced a portrayal of Chinese views as it might otherwise, but that's not the fault of the reporters. Nor is it a function of bias, despite claims one so often hears from Beijing and its supporters about how the Western media is biased, that it's anti-China, that it has an agenda to defame China, and so on. In fact, responsible reporters want to get input from all sides on important stories. But they have to do their jobs and will end up putting the story out with whatever material they can gather by their filing deadline. If the Chinese side won't engage, then it has only itself to blame. There's another reason, I think, for the tension between the American or Western press and the Chinese authorities, and that actually has to do with the nature of journalism itself. At its finest, the role of journalism in the US has been to shine a light in dark places, to hold the powerful accountable, to be a voice for the voiceless. And that's as true for a correspondent uh, in London or Tel Aviv or Washington or Jerusalem or Moscow or Delhi as it is for a correspondent in Beijing. And that's why so many governments don't like the press. And I think, especially in China, there is a clash between the Chinese Communist Party's impulse towards total control and our notion of what good journalism is. This, by the way, is the late Dave Schweisberg, who was UPI's bureau chief in Beijing in the late 1980s and 90s, and was a great reporter who exemplified the kind of tradition that I just talked about. And in fact, it's worth emphasizing that this is not just a Western notion. In Asia, for instance, you have a pretty free press in Japan, South Korea, Taiwan. You had it in Hong Kong before China imposed its national security law. You even see it in the Philippines, where my old friend Maria Reza won the Nobel Peace Prize for her efforts to report on issues the authorities there didn't want covered. So it's not a function of reporters being, quote, anti-China. Indeed, I would say that most of the journalists who appear in assignment China really like China. For them, China was a passion. It was a calling. I know in my own case that was true. I was entranced with China long before I became a journalist. In fact, I became a journalist because I was entranced with China. Most journalists who spend time 
uh, to learn Chinese, to study the country, agree to live there and bring their families there, despite all the difficulties, don't do so because they hate China. They do so because they like it, they're fascinated by it, and they want to experience it. Indeed, I think one of the most unfortunate consequences of the sharp drop in American media access towards China is that the ability of reporters who are basically positively disposed towards the people of China to go around the country, to talk to folks, witness for themselves what is going on has been so severely limited. Being there is the essential foundation for good journalism, and that has become harder and harder to do. The result is that even more of the coverage has become focused on the tension and the conflicts dividing China and the US since the official statements and the diplomatic and sometimes military maneuvering is easier to follow and report on. What's increasingly missing is the ability of journalists to convey the richness and complexity of the world's most populous nation, the shared humanity that we also need to understand, especially as the US and China continue to move ever closer to confrontation. So let me stop there. Thanks for your attention and very happy to hear your comments and questions. Mike, thanks so much. That was excellent. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about when, when you were doing your um, uh, talk is how much access I, I was in China uh, with the Associated Press in 88, 89, but then I returned part of Mike's story in 96, 97, and stayed until 2003. And the thing that really struck me was that period of time was sort of, I, I call it the Bronze Age. Of, of journalism in China, because we were seen by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the National Defense University, even some people within the Ministry of State Security, definitely the Ministry of Commerce, as useful idiots, you could say, or useful to their policy of trying to explain their story to the West. And uh, I was talking, and I, I used to have literally every Every month, I would have a private lunch with Sui Tianghai, who used to be the Chinese ambassador to Washington. He was head of policy planning at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We'd have a lunch every month, and he would be interested in what I was writing about, what I was interested in, and whether he could help me or not. But several of the lunches were, um, I could use what he'd said. He said. He sometimes would bring, the, there was a wonderful character who was the um, department chief for um, uh, disarmament named Sha Zukang, who was at one time China's ambassador to the UN, I think. He would bring him along, and Sha was very um, ebullient, and he would literally like yell at me, but in a pleasant type of way. Um, and they were always very interested in getting their story on the front page of the Washington Post. And, and basically, and, if, and if, a, if a senior Chinese official wanted to tell me something, I was more than happy to report it. Um, and that period is over. And I'm wondering, do you think that, that that has actually hurt China's ability? Because now we have this those whole the Chinese talk about telling China's story well, which they do through their state-run uh, state, state media. But do you think that China has hurt itself in a way uh, by, by cutting people out you know, uh, and, and basically relying on their own Xinhua news agency to tell China's story? I think China has hurt itself and is hurting itself badly by, do, by doing this. Um, there, there is a sense in, in, in recent years, uh, particularly um, that the nature of the, the media has changed with the internet, with uh, so many other tools. The Chinese now want to control the narrative, not only at home, but internationally. And, and they want to do it themselves. And they don't see the Western press as uh, useful vehicles to communicate anymore. Um, but I think, as a result, the presentation of China that comes out lacks, completely lacks credibility because it's, it's Chinese Communist Party propaganda. And I think not having reporters able to go around the country and get into the sort of human interest stories uh, that are, I think, 
uh, I always felt were sort of the most interesting and most fun, much more than the high level political stuff. Um, the, between the, the, the number of journalists based in, in, in China having been reduced very dramatically and those who are there are, are very constrained in what they can do. I mean, I remember, uh, you know, it used to be you could, you could go to a village if you wanted to, if your, your organization would let you, and stay there for two weeks and really soak up what was going on and write about it. That's almost impossible to do now, even if a news organization has somebody on the ground, the authorities are unlikely to give them that degree of unfettered access. Uh, and, um, and, and, and also, the nature of the media has changed. No news organization is going to let their reporter be out of pocket that long because they have to tweet and file for the website and do all the other things that didn't exist back when we were doing this. Thank so goodness. I, thank goodness. So, so I think, but I think we're hurt because we don't get that sense of the texture of Chinese society. I mean, this is a living, breathing country of 1.3 billion people. It's not just what the propaganda in the official Chinese media makes it out to be. And it's not just what the China bashing members of Congress make it out to be. It's much more complicated. But the ability of reporters from the US and other international media to convey the complexity, the subtlety, the nuance um, is really deeply constrained in a way that hurts both sides and fuels the misunderstanding that's already at a very high pitch now. So uh, one of the things that I was also thinking about when I was when I was listening to you speak is, have you ever talked to sort of flipped it and talked to Chinese reporters in the United States, and have you ever gotten a sense of like how how they do their their work? Because I I, I, I haven't actually. I've always been on the other side. Right. I don't know. I don't know if if you have. I, you know, I would think they would have. You know, they have all the opportunities of not being bothered by the same degree of control, but they have limits internally, I would think, about what they can do and, and what they can say. So yeah. they certainly know a lot more than they're able to publish, that's for sure. But, but what they see about it, I, I there is an anecdote um, in 1979 when the US and China normalized relations. Um, Richard Bernstein of Time Magazine uh, was the first Time reporter, and he told me this story that he was very excited to go, and he sought out uh, the guy who was going to be like the first Xinhua reporter. And he said, you know, we should partner, we should push both our sides for greater access. And he said the Xinhua guy was utterly uninterested. You know, he was just towing the party line. Uh, well, it's probably also his, you know, his job as well. So, um, uh, question, when you were doing the research for the book, were there certain like traits that you found that were running through the journalistic community um, that that struck like oh my god here's that trait again um, in terms of uh, in, and you know you mentioned it you know, this curiosity willingness to live in another country openness but there, were there other things specifically in terms of China? Well, you know most of the successful journalists in China had a kind of. I don't know what the right word is, kind of low-grade cunning. I mean, willing to kind of bend the rules, cut corners, do, do, do what you needed to do. Uh, I'll give you one very good example. Um, the only American television news report from the, on the Cultural Revolution was done in 1967 um, when Morley Safer, who many of you will remember as a, the host of 60 Minutes, was a CBS News correspondent. Um, He's Canadian, so he didn't have an American passport. And he pretended to be an art historian, some, some, something having nothing to do with journalism. And then with a cameraman who pretended to be a travel agent, they both got tourist visas and they went to China. They brought a little camera with them, uh, pretending to just be tourists taking pictures. And the Chinese didn't figure it out. And he was there for a month. And even though he had an experience, for example, of making a offhand comment about Chinese agricultural machinery, which angered the Red Guards accompanying them because uh, he said, uh, they, they were saying it's all Chinese-made machinery. And Safer said to the camera, oh, it's clearly not. So he was actually put on a, like, taken to a kangaroo court and made to do a confession and so on. But he came back and he produced this wonderful film called Morley Safer's Red China Diary, which I got a hold of, and which Safer talks at length about in, in the book. But that's an example of you know, doing what you can to get around the rules. And I think if you're going to work in that kind of system, you know, people are always doing things that this kind of you know, sort of daring do, uh, bending the rules, uh, 
how, so that's one trait which you have to have to operate there. You know, and underpinning it all is the central theme that goes through the whole book, which is this built-in tension between the efforts of the American press corps to kind of penetrate the veil of secrecy that has been uh, put in front of them and the Chinese Communist Party's efforts to prevent them from doing that and to control the narrative. And that, that is the central fact of life, and it, it, it exists throughout the book. It ebbs and flows. There were periods like the late 80s, which were before Tiananmen, which were very open, and then late 90s, early 2000s, and then it's tighter. Um, but it's always there, and that just shapes the whole experience of reporting for everybody who does it. Yeah, I can speak from experience. We have questions. I'm happy to take questions and continue. Sure. Uh, you need to, to wait for a microphone. And when you um, answer, ask questions, please no speeches. Uh, try to ask a question, which would be great. Hi there. My name's Matt. I was a freelancer in Beijing from 2014 to 19, and I'm now a PhD student in Stanford looking into some of these questions you described. So it's really exciting for me to be here. Um, I, two, I have two questions. If you can't answer both, just pick one. The first is what you believe the consequences to, of the shift towards more heritage speakers in the reporting core has been for the types of things that get told. And I'm you know, thinking, of course, of like Ling Ling Wei and Li Yuan and Emily Fung, who are all doing great work. And I'm wondering what you guys think about that. And then the second is something that I've been wondering more in the last few years, which is why the CCP allows foreign journalists at all now. Um, so whichever you guys feel like answering would be great. Well, I, I mean, I think the, 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 the composition of the press corps changed in, re in, in, in recent years. And you had a lot more people who were ethnic Chinese who either born and raised in China or families from China um, who spoke essentially native level Chinese. And I think that that played an important role in people getting further into the society than somebody who looks like us is ever going to get because you stand out like a sore thumb there. So I think that's I think that is uh, a, a good a good thing. And on the on the other point, I guess at one level, China still wants to be seen as a kind of, you know, all the big international players have a New York Times bureau. And, you know, that's just part of the game. Um, so they're trying to have it, but they're also trying to very much control it and 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 limit what it can do and uh, prevent it from doing some of the things that it that the those kinds of news organizations like to do. But I think it's part of China's, you know, we're a big power and all big powers have some of this, but not enough to give us difficulty. And one of the greatest Maoist era propaganda is that we have friends all over the world. So, um, and, and if you've noticed, you've probably been looking at the National People's Congress and at the 20th Party Congress as well, and, and both Li Qiang yesterday, well, today, today China time, uh, came out and thanked all the journalists covering, and as did Xi Jinping when he was ending up the 20th Party Congress, specifically the foreigners as well. And during the press conference, they picked on several foreigners, as they always do. Those are prearranged, but nonetheless, it's to show their internationalization and, and that they're, they're a great superpower. I think that clearly. Sir. Wait, wait for you. Wait for the mic. Um, I was wondering um, what your thoughts were on the differences between media ecosystems um, in China from the perspective of Western journalists. So um, Tencent, Alibaba, and how those different platforms uh, may or may not differ in terms of receptivity to um, to kind of freedom of press and those types of issues. Well, Chinese Communist Party doesn't allow freedom of press. So they have to navigate in a system where there is no freedom. So they're, you know, um, and especially now when, when these big tech companies are, are kind of under siege from the, from the authorities. So I, I, you know, they're, they're very important in, I mean, the, the, the tools that they have are very important to the daily lives of Chinese people. Um, but I think the, the constraints profoundly limit what, what, if any, role they can play. And you just look at the the gap between TikTok in the United States and Douyin in China, there's a huge gap into what is permissible on TikTok here versus what's permissible in Douyin, and that's one company. Um, and the chief censor actually is involved with both. So um, there's a huge difference. Uh, <clears throat> hi, Tom Gold, UC Berkeley. I uh, very much appreciate 
your presentation. And actually, these issues have been debated since the since the 80s. I remember at Berkeley when we would have journalists come in, and it was the same <clears throat> the same mantra. Not, not that don't mean to disparage what you're saying. It just shows how little things have changed structurally in many ways. But I had occasion over the weekend to be in Washington and was talking to some top-level officials, and it was uh, Chinese officials about why are there so many problems in U.S.-China relations and the decline in, in, the, in the conditions. And two things. One is politics. Like, of course, China doesn't have politics. And the other is the media, the misrepresentation of the media. And the response is, of course, well, if you gave the media more access to give a more honest portrayal of China, oh, you know, we, they, they, there's a sort of a gotcha mentality, I think, they think. So that's one reason they want to control the media so tightly. So it's well, and, sort of and, a plus a change. Yeah, it, 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 you know, the, the, pro the, the problem is, it's always been true in the Chinese system, and it's especially true today. Um, if you're a mid-level official uh, and, you have, and you're open-minded enough to appreciate that there is that, that coverage is not uniformly negative and doesn't always have to be bad news. Uh, and then if you gave access, you would get some good news as well. But in that system, you go up the chain of command, you, re you get some, you convince somebody to let a reporter go to your city or your province and the province chief doesn't like the 30% that's negative before the 70% that's positive. There goes your career. Maybe that's their career if Xi Jinping hears about it. Uh, so so um, the system doesn't have the flexibility. Uh, and and uh, it's so black and white in, in, in their own portrayal. Um, and, 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 and then you add to that the fact that, as I tried to indicate, journalists will do good news story if there's good news, but their job isn't to do good news stories. And, you know, I flew here across the Pacific on Saturday and my plane landed and here I am. It's not news, but if the plane went into the bay and 300 people were killed, it would be news. That's just the nature of the beast. And so um, that's something the Chinese really struggle with and, and their system allows at various times, it allowed more, but now it allows almost none of that. So, so it, it's a real problem to sort of break the logjam. Yeah, I, I mean, I also think there's really been a fundamental shift in the last 10 years. Under, but, it, but it started under Hu Jintao, right? I mean, it's not simply Xi Jinping. The situation became significantly worse under him. And the last Chinese leader, correct me if I'm wrong, to have been interviewed by a Western press was Jiang Zemin or Wen Jiabao, right? That was that. Uh, Hu Jintao's never. I think Wen Jiabao did. No, I interviewed, I interviewed Wen Jiabao, so I... So did Chris John Amon yeah, for and, and I interviewed and, John Zemin. John Zemin, everybody interviewed, <laughs> everyone interviewed John Zemin. Barbara Walters in Assignment China has, she got the first interview with John Zemin, and she yeah. has this great story about, she brought with her a photograph of the guy in front of the tank, and she like hid it in her pocket, and then um, she pulls it out in the middle of the interview, and she says, what happened to this guy? And, and John Zemin goes into English and quotes Shakespeare and says, much ado about nothing. <laughs> um, so, but I think after, uh, Hu Jintao never sat, and uh, Xi Jinping, of course, hasn't. And I think that's a sort of an indication of this paranoia um, and the lack of trust. And for sure, journalists screw up. We often go for the wrong story, et cetera, et cetera. But the benefits that China could have accrued to this is, are gone. And I think that, um, and, and I've engaged with Chinese diplomats, et cetera, and they ask the same question, it's all the media's fault, why can't you write it? And actually, it's not simply China. I mean, I remember I uh, had a dinner with uh, Dianne Feinstein at the House of the Ambassador uh, during um, her great power. She's uh, obviously ill now, but um, she came up to me wagging her finger saying, why can't you write more positive stories about China? So it's not simply, it's not simply the Chinese officials either. In the back. Um, I'm interested in understanding what maybe some of the fringe benefits will come from having so many reporters now reporting out of Taiwan. Um, obviously, it's it's less than ideal, but it kind of hearkening back to what you talked about in your speech about um, watching from Hong Kong. Is there anything that good that could come from having so many top class reporters reporting from Taiwan? Well, it's interesting. I live in Taiwan now, and um, there are a lot of journalists, including some who had to leave China, 
it, it, it has the advantage that it's a Chinese-speaking society, that it's you know, kind of focused on uh, the mainland. There is quite a lot of back and forth still of business people and so on. Um, but it's very frustrating. And, and uh, the reporters there spend most of their time doing what somebody would be doing watching China here or in Seoul, or which is going online and trolling the internet and looking at the Chinese media. And uh, I, I just say to people, um, if you don't know the work of Father Ladani, the great Jesuit uh, priest who uh, was in, published for 30 years in Hong Kong in this wonderful weekly newsletter called the China News Analysis, which was based entirely on his reading of the Chinese press. And nobody could do it like him. And I'm sort of dusting off my father Ladani now to, because I think that's uh, what's going to happen. But ta Taiwan is also, you know, they're being very welcoming. And of course, politically for the government, it allows them to say, we host people when China is kicking them out. Um, and I suppose it's better to be closer than to be doing it from London. But objectively, I don't know how much really real difference it makes. Yeah. Ben. Hi, uh, Pamela Yatsko. I was uh, based in Shanghai uh, for the Paris Hi, Eastern Pamela. Economic. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I owe you my connection to my book publisher. Oh, I don't know okay. if you remember that, <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, um, I uh, I'm just so curious to know what a day in the life of a journalist who's based in Sh in in Beijing or Shanghai now is in terms of the level of surveillance that they have. Can they meet? with someone without the Chinese government knowing about it, or do they know all their moves? I mean, it, it just is, uh, again, it was really the heyday of journalism. Who knew in the 90s? Uh, but um, I mean, I don't know. I haven't been in China in about five years. And um, I, think, I think the assumption is the surveillance state is, is a fact of life. And you, know, you can be tracked everywhere you go, every phone call you make, every everything you do online. But it's not foolproof. And I have, there are two chapters in Assignment China uh, about the way reporters uh, covered the, the crackdown on the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And I mean, people talked about, for example, uh, uh, getting a, uh, a flight that arrived in uh, not, um, not in Rumchi, in, in another city, getting a flight that arrived at 5 AM, wearing a raincoat and a hat getting a taxi, going to the house of somebody who they had gotten the address of, showing up, uh, doing the interviews. Every 30 minutes, they would pop a, a, a thumb driver or drive, put it in their shoe. Uh, every hour and a half, they'd go to the bathroom, diet, make an internet, you know, get an international signal, and upload it to the cloud. So by the time the security people came, you know, two and a half hours later, They'd gotten what they needed, and they'd gotten most of the information out. But it's very hard. There's a, there's a piece that uh, uh, Chris Buckley and Austin Ramsey and Paul Moser of the New York Times did on Xinjiang. Um, they went for 10 days. They didn't speak to anyone, because they just thought, if we talk to somebody, we're going to get them into trouble. They just took as many photos and videos as they could. And the piece was essentially a photo essay, because they couldn't talk to people. And they thought, at least you get a sense of what it looks and feels like. So I think it's very, very tough. Hi. Uh, my name is Yuan Garcia. I'm from Mills High School. Um, asking is, do you think there's ever going to be a recoming of that golden age of journalism? Um, as a half Chinese American, I really would love to see the journalism prosper within China. But I did, really don't see that happening, given the lack of free speech. So what needs to happen, if at all, that would bring that golden age of journalism back? Well, the first thing I would say is that having, you know, predicting what's going to happen in China is very problematic. Uh, it's so easy to be wrong. Um, you know, when I went in 1973 and I crossed the border into Shenzhen, which was a little fishing village, if somebody had said 30 years later it would be full of skyscrapers and this huge economic hub, I would have thought they were you know, on drugs. So who, know, who knows? But China, you know, there need to be changes in China that I don't see forthcoming now, but not 
everything lasts forever. Uh, we've seen in many authoritarian countries uh, that there are political changes. We saw it in China, the Deng moving the country away from Mao. Um, we saw it in Russia, in the Soviet Union, Khrushchev moving away from Stalin. So there are all sorts of ways in which it could change. I don't, then the mere fact that one doesn't see it now doesn't mean that it's never gonna happen. But I'm not, I, I wouldn't hold my breath at this stage. Uh, Tazulisi Mills High School. Um, so the question I wanted to ask is you speak to this culture of uh, paranoia and um, also of deception, you know, in, in China. Um, and as someone with uh, family members who have done business with China, they speak to this as well. Um, and so I guess what I was wondering is I don't notice this culture as prevalent in other areas of Asia, like as in, uh, for example, Korea, Japan, uh, t even Taiwan even. So um, it, it, how, what do you attribute this culture to? Do you attribute it to the Cultural Revolution um, or something else? I'm curious to know your opinion. Uh, that's a tough one. Um, I think it's. It, I think a lot of it has to do with the nature of the Chinese Communist Party and its relationship with the truth, uh, which is that it bends things to suit its political needs. Um, I think there's a sort of a, uh, China, the experience of Chinese dealing with non-Chinese, China dealing with the rest of the world has been very fraught for a very long time, and there are layers and layers and layers of history and emotion and misunderstanding um, uh, that, go, that goes along with it. Uh, but the other countries you mentioned have different kinds of political systems and economic systems and value systems that come with that, even if they all come from a sort of certain tradi Confucian traditional background. So I think the political system is key. Sir. Uh, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> Mike Zelensinger, another ink stained wretch from another era, and that's sort of the root of my question. Um, both in Hong Kong in the recent protests and since the COVID, the lifting of the COVID mandates, we've seen a few cracks in terms of the new, I'm, I'm curious about the new ecosystem of media. You know, I have a young colleague who says she gets her news from TikTok. Now, I don't quite understand that, but that does represent an important demographic of the younger generation. We've seen some cracks in the, you know, e-news e around COVID and Weibao and a few others. To what extent do you think there's any potential for that to crack a little wide, more wide open? In China? In China. Right now, very little. Uh, I think, you know, the, the, I mean, Xi Jinping's goal, everything he's doing has been tighter control, and obviously there's a conscious judgment that that is what the Chinese Communist Party, and by extension, what the Chinese Communist Party thinks you know, is all of China, needs to address the problems that it's facing. And so, I mean, even at the National People's Congress, the trend is more of the, the party taking a greater control over everything, and, and that's the direction. Uh, how long will it last? I don't know. I mean, it's a whole separate discussion, sort of the future of China. I think there are underlying systemic issues that make China both extremely tightly controlled, but there's also a fundamental fragility that may play out, but in, in what way, I don't know. So in the short term, I don't, I don't think we'll see that at all. But, but if I could add, Mike, to your point, you do have a sense that, I don't know whether this is true or not, but a sense that the zero COVID policy was deep sixed after the demonstrations, and they might have played a role in that. Um, and secondly, Chinese journalists want to be good journalists, uh, as you mentioned. Um, and when, I, you know, when we were in China, there was, there was great journalism being done, so they know how to do it. So there's obviously a desire in that pub, in, in that kind of community to, to be better reporters, but the problem right now is, is the structure of the government. Yeah. I think, you know, they're, they're, if the climate changed, as John's right, there, there, there are forces, individuals, organizations um, who, could, who could play that more of that kind of role, but at the moment, the climate doesn't allow that. In the back. So the talk I attended last time was uh, the avoidable war between China and the U.S. So how bad is the situation right now? Especially right now, you're living in Taiwan. You mentioned, like, do you feel you know there's like invasion of some sort soon? Or uh, I certainly hope it's avoidable. Um, 
I, it's, ve it's very complicated. And, and um, I don't, my own personal judgment is that, that China is not sort of gearing up to you know, attack Taiwan anytime soon. But it's clear that Xi Jinping has uh, tasked the People's Liberation Army with acquiring the capability to do that by 2027. Um, and so, uh, and, and you also have uh, kind of a very strong pushback uh, uh, and, and growing hostility towards China from the United States. What worries me at the moment is um, uh, the, what I like to call the cock-up theory of international relations, an accidental conflict. And I think the danger of that is real. Uh, the number of Chinese sorties uh, being conducted every day into Taiwan's air defense identification zone uh, is growing steadily. Uh, the military presence of American aircraft and American Navy ships uh, in and around Taiwan and in the South China Sea is increasing. Um, there was a CNN report the other day, the, the US uh, 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 military took a CNN crew on a plane that went through the Taiwan Straits and then down around the South China Sea, and they had a Chinese aircraft 500 feet off their wing warning them off and saying, this is the People's Liberation Army, your own Chinese airspace, and so on. Uh, it takes very, very little, one wrong move, one slightly tired pilot, one testosterone overloaded commander, and boom, you have a replay of the 2001 EP-3 spy plane. And what you don't have now, which you did have then, were two presidents eager to have good relations. Um, and I thought uh, the balloon episode was very telling, most significantly, significantly because the Chinese Minister of Defense wouldn't take a call from the US Secretary of Defense. So the danger of an accidental incident in which the lines of communication are bad, creating extreme pressure on one side or another could lead to an unintended cycle of escalation. So in the sort of near to medium term, that's what worries me. Uh, longer term, I think the Chinese, if they conclude that there isn't gonna be a deal on, they don't wanna get Taiwan by having a war. They wanna have, be able to absorb Taiwan without firing a shot. But if they conclude that the politics are making that increasingly impossible, um, or the domestic politics in China are such that, that Xi Jinping feels that he needs this external diversion for his own political considerations. Who knows? I mean, just because it doesn't make sense doesn't mean that leaders don't do stupid things. Ask Vladimir Putin about that. Good, good answer. Sir. Roger Dong, former defense attache in Taiwan. Uh, I've been watching the Cyrus Johnson videos on YouTube. He portrays a very different situation in Xinjiang than our own press has, has de depicted. What's been your reading of the, what's happening in Xinjiang? He, he, t he says that while it was true that initially the insurgents were very roughly treated, but currently people get to go to the mosque five times a day, and particularly the, the women who speak Ch learn Chinese get great jobs. I haven't been to Xinjiang, so um, all I can tell you is from the more than, I guess, a dozen journalists that I interviewed for Assignment China who went in sort of 2016, 17, 18, 19 period, their, their accounts are absolutely horrifying. And I would take, I, I have no reason to doubt the accuracy of those reports. There is a industry, a cottage industry, though, of people um, who are Western correspondents, quote unquote, who do position themselves as spokespeople on behalf of China. And they have actually a act, very active Twitter following. Um, they're back to this sort of this e-media sort of space. They're very active in that space. And that is kind of part of the US-China kind of media relationship because for uh, decades, we there, there have been those reporters. Um, Edgar Snow in his later life would be a perfect example. He went to China during the height of the Great Leap Forward and didn't see a starving Chinese person. So um, there is that part of our tradition as well. Um, so, from what I've heard, there is a lot of cultural change needs to happen in order for journalists, for example, to feel free to do their jobs in China and for citizens to feel that they are free to express dissent. And in order for 
this cultural change to happen, political change has to happen as well. You need like a strong citizenry, a strong press, and like strong business leaders who are willing to put um, like decency over profits and their political connections. So in order for all of those things to happen, like what are the factors that, for example, the citizenry or the people or um, business, leaders, business leaders need to change in order to make this cultural change lead to political change? I realize this is a bit of a chicken and egg, egg problem as well. I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> it's, it's, a very, it's a very tough question. I mean, in the end, it's for people of China to figure out their own system. Um, the, the way the system has evolved, though, from sort of the period when we were first working there as journalists, when the tendency seemed to be to slowly but steadily increase the degree of openness. There were efforts by the, go by the like Zhao Jiang when he was the Communist Party chief, uh, to try and move the government a little bit away from the Communist Party and allow the government to sort of run the day-to-day you know, operation of the government and the system uh, and, and have the party step back. Um, and there was a sort of gradual loosening of all the ideological controls and the ideological indoctrination, um, the evolution of the Chinese media so that you did have, as this John mentioned, you know, Chinese reporters were really good reporters and tried to do real journalism as, as we know it. But unfortunately, all those trends have been put into reverse in the last dozen years or so. Um, and what's, gonna, what's it gonna take to unreverse them? I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, final question. Sir. Thank you both very much for this. Um, I'm gonna change gears a little bit. I'd like to ask you a question about you two. Um, I mean, Mike, you showed pictures of yourself in 1973. It's now 2023. That's 50 years. Yeah, a little more gray hair. And um, I look the Still same. Still <laughs> And, um, you know, you, you mentioned before how most reporters in China really have a fondness for China. So the two of, between the two of you, you have decades of experience in China, and neither of you can go back. I'm wondering, at your age and at this stage in your careers, how does that make you feel? It's sad. You know, I, I've devoted most of my professional life to trying to understand China. I did it because I like China. I, I like the language, the culture. Um, and it's a pity that the situation in China and the nature of the U.S.-China relationship has evolved in such a way uh, that lot, I'm, I, we are, I'm hardly alone in, in, in that. There are lots of people who, for a variety of reasons, don't feel that it's... Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a good time to go back, but it's sad. Uh, I kind of would second his emotion. I've become a China watcher, a la Hong Kong. Uh, I read a lot of Chinese periodicals all day, every day, uh, as part of my work. Uh, and so literally, I've, like, back to Mike's point, I, I could very well be in Taipei, but I happen to be in Berkeley. Um, just spent all morning hashing through three recent speeches by Xi Jinping. Uh, which scared the shit out of me, actually. That's a technical term, but, but that's what I do. And would I like to go back to China? Yeah, for sure. At, but I don't want to go to a country where if I pass through Hong Kong, I can be pulled off a plane and be accused of violating the national security law. It's not worth it. OK. Let's thank our speaker and moderator. It was a really excellent presentation, Mike. I loved your use of sound bites throughout, brought back a lot of memories from time on the ground in Shanghai. John, fantastic interactive discussion, really appreciate that. And Mary Kay for partnering with the Center on US-China Relations in New York. Thank you for the opportunity to do that. For everyone here and everyone that's watching online, we have a couple upcoming programs to tell you about on March 22nd, which is next week. We're gonna host the next of our four Consuls General series. We're gonna talk about security and the path to peace. We have Consuls General from Japan, Georgia, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. There is gonna be a reception with food and drink around that, so please do join us. On March 20th, we're gonna host John Delory with Orville Shell. That's going to be in Silicon Valley on espionage, subversion, and political intrigue in China. 
and our 25th anniversary gala that's going to be held at City Hall on April 19th. We're going to be honoring Asians and Asian Americans. Don't miss that. Sign up on our website. We, we host events in San Francisco and in Silicon Valley and online. If you're not a member, join us. You get 50% off tickets. If you would like to volunteer, check out our eblast because we are always looking for volunteers to help us at our events. Thank you to our team, Mackenzie Jacobic, Nina Urugawa, Aaron Moroccan, and all of our interns and volunteers. We can't do it without you. And now we have a book selling and signing. So it's going to be right outside those doors. If you pre-purchased a book, never fear. Stand in the same line. We have that tracked. You don't have to pay twice unless you would like to. <laughs> And thank you again very much on behalf of the Asia Society Northern California Center. Thank you for joining us.